Hi, I'm Cathy Speed. I'm a consultant in rheumatology, sport and exercise medicine. And my particular interest is the holistic management of musculoskeletal injuries. Um, the concept of this evening was to talk about interventions in the form of primarily injections, but I'm going to talk about the wider scope of some of the typical uh, medications we use in sports injuries to try to give a few <coughs> what I hope will be simple messages. Um, and actually, we're here to talk this evening because there are so many different therapies um, from a non-surgical perspective that we use in musculoskeletal injuries that it can get pretty confusing. And um, I'm going to try to cover rather uh, rapidly um, quite a few different types of interventions that we might typically use in the uh, sports injury clinic. Um, and uh, I think that essentially one of the most important things that we recognize is that there's, there's a lot of confusion. There is a huge amount of um, debate about when to use different interventions and why. One of the reasons that we get confused and we have so much debate in musculoskeletal injuries in terms of um, non-surgical in interventions is that if I was a cardiologist and I was giving you a lectures on best interventions, we would only cover um, these areas here from uh, good, large, randomized controlled trials and right up to the pinnacle of systematic reviews uh, of ev the evidence base. And we're not very good at doing that in, um, in musculoskeletal complaints. One of the problems is that once we've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Once we use an intervention for one condition, we think it translates to every other musculoskeletal conditions uh, that, we, that we might treat. And, and I think we would all recognize that that's false optimism. If we take the example of a, uh, an Achilles tendon, we know that patients will differ depending upon on the type of tendon injury they have, the presence or absence of <coughs> neovascularization, the grade of tendinopathy they might have, is the problem at the insertion or is it at the mid portion, etc., etc. So translating evidence base from one injury to another, we have to accept, is not necessarily a straightforward intellectual process. And so this lovely um, pyramid of evidence-based medicine actually escapes us somewhat in terms of uh, discussing best interventions and arguing the case for different interventions. And so when we talk about evidence-based medicine in musculoskeletal practice, this is much more of a realistic framework. So we take our experience, we work together to discuss um, different interventions that we're using, we take the particular characteristics of the patient, we take the best evidence that we can, and we pool it to try to improve outcome for that one individual patient. And that's essentially what's often different about musculoskeletal practice. So I'm gonna cover some of these um, pills and potions. And if we look, to look at all of these um, interventions, and um, both Jason and uh, Andy are going to discuss more about injection therapies, um, actually, we have to stop and think, what are we aiming to achieve uh, with these types of uh, interventions? So the aims, well, we might think we need to pain manage to facilitate rehabilitation. Uh, maybe we might think we might modify the disease process. Um, people talk about regeneration. Everyone loves the word regenerative um, in, in musculoskeletal practice. And obviously, we hope to optimize uh, function but effectively, if we look at the list of things that I have put up there and I'm going to discuss, we're really treating things with anti-inflammatory approaches. If you look at the characteristics of many of the typical medications that we have to our, um, to our hands now in musculoskeletal practice, most of them are working primarily on the concept of inflammation. And we know that inflammation is a good thing. So the natural process of uh, tissue inflammation should not be interfered with unless we really have to. So when should we intervene? If inflammation is excessive, meaning if it limits the early phase of rehabilitation, or if it is excessive in terms of the fact that it's continuing on past um, seven days or so, if it's limiting the full assessment of the condition, those are the things that actually are the limited criteria upon which we base um, our decision making to intervene in relation to inflammation. And these are the anti-inflammatory agents that typically people would talk about in musculoskeletal practice. Non-steroidal agents, topical trial meal, uh, corticosteroid, viscous supplement and trial meal zeal injections are the typical agents in sports medicine practice right now that we might reach for 
and people talk about anti-inflammatory properties of PRP, and I'm going to mention PRP towards the end, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what really cell therapies means, um, predominantly just as a passing few comments. And this is the format upon which we would usually use these agents. We'd stop with, start with topical agents. If they don't work, we move on to oral, non steroidal agents. If they don't work, we move on to injections. Now, in terms of risk-benefit, that, that approach isn't necessarily the right way around, as you'll see in a few slides. But actually, from a practical accessibility approach, it's probably the easiest um, framework to base our thoughts on. So as far as non steroidal agents, do they work in musculoskeletal pain or not? Across the board, non steroidal agents, either topical and oral, have good efficacy in pain management. Anything that's on the left side of this line, these are all different studies of different sizes in topical non steroidal agents in, um, uh, in uh, musculoskeletal injuries. The evidence is strongly in the favor of them working. And the same applies to oral anti-inflammatory agents. They're all pretty effective in managing uh, acute and chronic musculoskeletal pain. If you look at topical non steroidal agents, it's actually pretty impressive how those agents get into even cartilage and meniscus uh, in terms of uh, regular application. So they get to the tissue. They may not work as effectively as oral non steroidal agents in some people, probably because of central effects of oral non steroidal agents. But if you're trying to treat local inflammation with a topical agent, you are just as likely to get that agent to the tissue in question through a topical agent um, than you will do through an oral agent. So eff effectively, they should be the first line of approach in injury. What's the downside of these, these agents? And in particular, what's the downside of using oral agents? Well, you're all familiar with these. And when I have patients who get really stuck on non steroidal agents, I just say, well, that's OK, but they typically will, can kill more patients than some cancers can. And that can change practice fairly quickly if patients are pretty reliant on the non steroidal agents orally. There's another element that we're all pretty familiar with in sports medicine, which is what about the effects on the tissue healing of non steroidal agents. And there are several studies now that indicate they inhibit soft tissue repair, particularly muscle, muscle regeneration, and they cause a weakening of the emphasis with um, uh, prolonged use. So essentially, that does make you rethink how quickly you would want to intervene with non steroidal agents. So when should we use these agents? Topically or, if really necessarily, orally, only in acute inflammation if it's excessive, if the patient is in severe pain, if the symptoms are not responding to anti-inflammatory agents over the course of 10 days, then the, the, the medication should not be continued and other approaches should be sought. And as I've said, avoid in, um, uh, in muscle injuries, and I haven't, I haven't got time to go into why we should avoid them in bone stress injuries, but effectively they do inhibit bone repair. So limit, limit our use of non steroidal agents but you, and use them as safely and as effectively as possible. Now, what about acute injuries? What else can we, uh, can we use? Uh, anyone who's familiar with trial meal, this is used a lot across the world, South America and Europe. Uh, topical trial meal gel. This is a randomized controlled uh, trial which effectively compared diclofenac with, um, with trial meal. And, and topical diclofenac is well proven in acute ankle sprain. Trial meal seems to have similar effects. Pluses or minuses, maybe less adverse effects with topical trial meal. Um, so it, there is evidence for, um, for its use in acute soft tissue injury. So those are the topical agents, and I've talked about oral agents, and what about getting into the main topic of injections. Corticosteroid injections, it's pretty simple to talk about their anti-inflammatory actions, but actually these agents have been around for 70 years and we still don't quite know how steroid injections work. They clearly don't just work on inflammation. They clearly have other um, uh, mechanisms by which they uh, control pain. Do they work in musculoskeletal injuries? Yes, in that they provide pain relief. Uh, and they will do in most musculoskeletal injuries. That's not to say we should use them, it's to say they will provide pain relief. Their relief, though, is short, and most well-designed randomized control studies would actually suggest that steroid injections would give three to six weeks of benefit. Now, that might reassure us that that means that most of the time the steroid isn't lingering around that will cause lots of 
potential adverse effects, but effectively we should remember that we are only facilitating pain management for six weeks. If that saves six weeks of oral non agents, maybe that's worth it, and I'll discuss that uh, shortly. So the evidence for benefit of corticosteroid injections in acute uh, complaints is um, in bursitis, such as this calcific tendonitis, and is in um, tenosynovitis, so long flexor tendons, extensor tendons with a tendon sheaths. Um, we know that there are times when we would not and should not use corticosteroids, and that's when there is evidence of significant underlying tendinopathy. So again, we, when we talk about do steroids work in tendons, yes, should we use them in some? And in those that have evidence of an inflammatory process, which is predominantly the, um, the tendon sheath problems, um, and in the absence of significant underlying tendinosis that would predispose uh, the patient to rupture. And this is the point. When we're looking at a lot of these agents, it's the risk-benefit ratio that we're measuring up. Not do they work, but what's the risk of using them? So um, again, judicious use of steroid injections in those patients who do not have the risk factors that would make us worry about using them. If we look at corticosteroid injections and other injections in osteoarthritis, um, again, I've talked to you about risk benefits. So purple is risk and gray is benefit. And if you compare steroids with non-steroidal agents, actually the, the risk benefit ratio is in the favor of steroids. Similarly, just moving on to um, viscous supplement injections, a similar um, risk ratio to corticosteroids, probably not as bad as non-steroidal use, um, not quite as effective as steroids. Now in clinical practice, what we actually do is we often combine steroids with viscous supplement. And this is on this theory that steroids have a peak of action of sort of three to five weeks and start to wear off. Viscous supplements typically don't start to work until often up to five weeks, depending upon what agent you're using. So you're trying to combine these agents to give a prolonged effect of, of an uh, intra-articular therapy um, that may actually give long-lasting relief. The problem is, much as this is common in clinical practice, so it's that bit of the evidence-based medicine profile that we should be considering, there are no randomized controlled trials that actually combine these agents. And that's because the pharmaceutical companies aren't interested in um, in promoting the combination. Moving on to Traumiel and Zeal injections, I've, inc I've included this slide because it's a really nice recent study that compared placebo with Traumiel Zeal intra-articular injection in patients with knee osteoarthritis. And there was significant benefit of the com combination of TZ uh, over placebo. Why is that useful? Because we're trying to avoid the uh, side effects of corticosteroid, which specifically include infection and tissue atrophy. More studies like this need to be done, but it's interesting when we're trying to find other intra-articular agents. So I've talked through this type of a um, process of choosing agents depending upon the situation, but I would urge you to consider that actually sometimes, if accessible, injection therapies might be a wiser choice for some patients rather than prolonged non steroidal use. Now, what about other approaches? I think it's worthwhile talking about um, high volume injections, and you're familiar with this, which is that where uh, we inject between the, uh, the fat pad and the, and the tendon to try to get rid of these new vessels um, are performed in patella tendons and Achilles tendons, but look at the level of evidence base that we're basing all these injections on. There's a very low level of evidence that supports their use, and so albeit that they, they show promise, the publications out there aren't there to, to defend us when we choose to use these types of approaches. What else? Well, in, in insertional tendinopathies, as a rheumatologist, um, I think we miss a lot of individuals who may respond to biologic agents. These agents are extremely effective at high level of, of evidence in patients with um, insertional enthesitis. That's those subset of people who've got an inflammatory type of insertional tendinopathy. And anyone heard of GTN patches in tendinopathy? So these are used um, quite commonly in the management of tendon complaints. They were developed really on the very simplistic thought of increased blood flow must increase um, uh, a tendon uh, physiology, uh, the health of the tendon. That's not actually probably true. 
um, it, they probably uh, reduce pain in tendinopathies because of um, at nitric oxide um, activity. But the level of evidence is reasonably good, randomized controlled trials. That's the type of uh, evidence base that we want to depend on. We use bone agents in, in um, bone injuries, and I don't have time to spend much time on this, but they act both in an anti-inflammatory way and, and on the bone itself. And we will use these in uh, recalcitrant stress fractures, and we'll use these in recalcitrant osteitis pubis to try to modify uh, the bone me remodeling that's going on. And um, these really are, are reserved for um, uh, recalcitrant cases. Now, very lastly and very quickly, cell therapies. This is a, 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 a figure of how rapidly publications in, in terms of growth factors and stem cells are in uh, musculoskeletal injuries over the recent years. And just shows how much the hype is, because most of these publications are nothing to do with uh, strict randomized controlled trials. They're commentary, commentaries, they're case studies, um, they're not very well designed research. And PRP is the most hyped up of the um, things that we use in sports medicine at the moment on the basis of the whole good old word regeneration and on the basis of the use of growth factors in these types of um, conditions. The problem is that there are an awful lot of other potentially pro-inflammatory um, cytokines and proteins that may actually aggravate the condition, not um, cure it. So the message on PRP is that although we can show some randomized controlled trials that looks at um, uh, benefit, um, there are many randomized controlled trials that do not show benefit in tendinopathies. And actually, if you look at the correlation between the quality of a trial and the result, the better design the trial, the more likely the result is negative. Um, and that's what we need to really face with PRPs. And lastly, a mention about cell therapies and tendon pathologies, because if people talk about this, they, we are a million miles away from getting there. If you look at animal models of mesenchymal stem cells and tendon healing, wonderful results, absolutely fantastic. That's brilliant. But the problem is, A, they use them incredibly early in the injury, and we don't see patients, or I don't see patients that quickly. Um, and we certainly wouldn't be running around with stem cells if we did. Um, and so we have huge challenges to meet in tendinopathies. And if our, in our working lifetime we get there with some form of cell therapy, and I could show you similar slides for joint injuries, uh, then we'll be hugely successful. But it, we need to focus on the so-called simple things that I spent most of the time talking about. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.